Aircon. Wormholes. And Tragedy Looper, new tragedies. This is staying in. Do you think this show, this episode, should come with a warning? A proviso? I think, a... I think every episode should come with a warning. <laughs> but if every episode comes with a warning, it kind of dilutes the impact and effect of the warning. No, that warning, not the same warning, a different warning each time. Oh, okay. L- caution. Caution. Long Johns. Caution. <laughs> uh, um Can't remember anything beyond Long Johns. Uh, 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 beyond be a pre Long John. Yeah, I mean, is there anything? Is there life? Be is there life before Long Johns? I don't. Think Blj, there is. Alj, yeah. <laughs> Blj. <laughs> um, but what sort of warning do you, would you suggest that we put on the front of this one, Sam? Uh, I just want to warn. Um, our lovely, adoring listener, who's looking beautiful today, that we're going to probably spend the entirety of this episode talking about our weekend Mm. at Aircon. Now, that's not to say it's not going to be fun. It's not to say that's not going to be hilarious japes or even a miracle or two included in what you're about to hear. It had everything. Um, it had everything, but yeah, but um, but but yeah, just to tell you, that's it's going to be pretty one note. <laughs> I think. If, if you get hardcore f- FOMO, yeah. Well, shall we shall we jump straight into it then? Two feet first. Two feet first. Talk about a board game convention that we were very excited about, Aircon. Yeah. And I think the main thing we need to talk about the headlining star of this was 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 essentially tea and mead <laughs> now i was going to actually ask a question actually because we had a listener contact us asking about like top tips going to a convention and i just wanted to ask you if there were any that having just been that we missed out on that list because one of them i wanted to say was i i forgot actually how the other senses play a part here. We briefly mentioned food. You know, there are, there were kind of food trucks there serving all kinds of cuisine, but also there were stalls selling food. Mm. And I, I was not expecting to walk away with two big full sachets of loose leaf tea and a bottle of mead. No, nope. mm. <laughs> I didn't either. No. No. When I when I st- when I was walking around the convention hall, I was like, "Where's where's Chris gone? Where's?" And I, and I found you yeah. with what can only dis- be described as a Viking man yeah. discussing the merits of mead. <laughs> I, thought, I thought Chris has found his people. Oh, it was incredible. Yeah. And, and I sampled every single mead they had there. I know you did. Bearing in mind, it's like 14% strength. I was going to say, is that why you stayed longer on the final day to like get rid of the edge? Oh, yeah. Oh, it really did take the edge off. It was this lovely, warm, fuzzy feeling. I woke up that day saying, do you know what? I'm not going to have any alcohol today. I'm good. Uh, but this was this was too good to resist. So this was uh, Nidhogger Mead. Apologies if I'm mispronouncing that. So they're, they're a company based in Yorkshire. And all of the ingredients that go into their mead are all locally produced, like local honey, say, for example. And they've got this myriad of flavours. There is traditional mead. There is ginger. There's lemon and lime raspberry and lemon and the one i went for which was the award-winning elderflower oh my word oh. and i've got some now with me here i mm. bet you do it's it's a lovely thing to have after dinner just a little oh, bit of mead it's a lovely look, little look the there. person i spoke to the viking i spoke to there <laughs> was saying it's quite nice to water down with uh, i think lemonade they have it with or tonic water i just have it neat yeah but yeah yeah out of a horn chalice of some sort um the classic Viking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so mead, mead, of course, is is honey. Gone. Yep. That's gone through the brewing process. So it's gone through the distillation process. It gets gets fermented, creates alcohol, and then it's basically like it's often. I believe in some fantasy books, it's referred to as like honey wine because it kind of has a, a bit of the consistency of wine. Like it's usually yeah. It's usually white, yeah. different versions. Like a of dessert wine. wine. Yeah, it, it can get as dark as a dessert wine, definitely. Uh, and then 
but and it's got really like really honey notes like you know how sometimes people say oh this red wine's really jammy or like oh this red wine really tastes like blackberries and you drink it and you're like it tastes like red wine right honey uh, mead absolutely yeah. tastes yeah. like honey you're not there's no pulling the wool over anybody's eyes it it tastes really sweet and delicious it's what winnie the pooh would drink if christopher robin went to university and came back and say you go pooh have some of this <laughs> have a bag on this um but, it, it, a bag of this. Um, but yeah i mean it's and it's a delicious thing and, and and mead's one of those things that like it's recently coming back into fashion actually you know so different boozes uh, they all have this kind of tilt to them so Pink yeah. gin became really, really yeah. big a couple of years ago. I think yeah. it still Spiced is. rum. Spiced rum. Well, yeah. I remember. Yeah. I remember the um, uh, there's a local uh, inn at uh, near, around the corner from where I live. We've all been there. Uh, it's where the cream bow was invented, uh, oh. which is nearly the cream bow's fourth anniversary this year. Jeez, Louise. So, and uh, it's a it's a you know it's a typical pub in a way that you play darts. There's a pool table, wood panelled walls and small round tables they still do um a quiz every thursday it's a quid to enter and you get sandwiches and crisps but i knew that the gin thing had really taken off when i walked into there and my wife asked for a gin and they went which one we've got 30 (laughs) (laughs) before then it was gordon's or nothing yeah gordon's (laughs) gordon's or get out yeah yeah um yeah and, um, you know, so all of these different boozes go through a bit of popular- different sort of levels of popularity. But mead recently is definitely, it's, it feels like it's kind of like the, the one that's kind of up and coming. Like it's, it's the one where everybody's like, ooh, all the sort of like special fancy pants food and drinks, like love that craft food movement are kind of like leaning towards mead at the moment. I can totally see why, because it's absolutely delicious. Now, I didn't get to try yeah. the one from Aircon. Because Chris had drank it. Because Chris I'd quaffed it. it all, yeah, he quaffed it. So, so your, so you tried the elder. Well, you tried all of but most of them. It sounds like, but the elderflower one that that sounds really exciting to me. Oh, it's really good. That sounds really good. So, why? Here's a question for you. <laughs> why were they at a board game convention? Like, what was the? What was? What do you think? Like, the link is there? Like, clearly, it worked well because they seem busy. Like, well, they. Yeah, I think there's something quite interesting about that. We were having, we had a brief chat about this because one thing I've noticed that is, you get to a point when you get into the hobby of board game collecting where mm. you achieve critical mass, yeah. almost where there are, you're less likely to buy new games if you've already got something of a similar genre already there. Sure. And what I've I've tended to find now is that I'm more interested in enriching what I've already got. So whether that might be getting a nice insert for it so it's easier to kind of set up it might be that i want to replace some of the components of it for higher quality ones or it might be that i make it more of an event when i play it so something that i do sam does and your partner does pete is when we play games they have a little soundtrack on in the background that complements that which is Mm -hmm. actually really quite nice and so that's really lovely and i think what this adds to that is a different sense so taste so I know you and I, Sam, really didn't like the game that people raved about, Blood Rage, about that kind of Vikings of Valhalla. Right. We didn't like that at all. But I could easily imagine a world in which someone plays that game and has mead, you know, they're, you know, sipping mead as they're playing. Right. Or, you know, there's lots of other Viking-themed board games out there, Yeah, uh, for example. Yeah. So I think it adds another sense to that, really. So I think there's an appeal there. Right, exactly, yes. right. Mm-hmm. So... I, I guess like, and I guess that's why it's got such a long connotation with things like fantasy, right? Like in fantasy, you get ale and mead and wine, and it's usually red wine, right? And I guess maybe there's like a fantasy element. There was a lot of fantasy, fantasy stuff seems very close to board games. You yeah, know? no, definitely. And, and that brings me to the second one I want to speak about is Honey Badger Games, who I've seen at a few conventions who are there yep. often with like sweets that are kind of like game components, like dice and things made that are like edible, they're like sweets. So what, 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 do, you, what do you mean, like a, a, a chocolate meeple or a... Kind of like, um, I think like gelatin kind of sweets that are kind of shaped that, you know, they're made in moulds, which are like almost like dice. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. But they brought to the convention um, t- their own brand of tea. Um, which I tried while you were off doing you and Sam were doing your own thing 
Mm-hmm. I went around basically just had this smorgasbord of mead and tea. And I got chatting to Kath, <laughs> um, Honey Badger, and they've, they've, they've really put a lot of effort into this. So basically you've got a tea for, I think, like each different typical class type you'd have in like an, a D&D campaign, an RPG. No. So they've, they've actually created a, a flavor profile for each one. So I got two. I got the barbarian, which was a spiced rubos, and I don't, of course, just like you. Yeah, well, yeah, of yeah. ovs, um, and I don't like rubos tea at all. But this, no, I don't. I sipped this, and I realised I've been drinking rubos tea wrong all these years. I'd usually been having it with a bit of milk, but actually, it's it's much oh, better neat. Oh, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. Chris. Well, I don't, I don't know. This is back when, like, I was getting into tea, really. Um, I suppose if no one tells you. No, nobody told me. But this is a spiced root boss. You know, I can imagine that as a barbarian, mm. that being, a, like, a perfect kind of elixir. There's an assassin, which is kind of a rose tea. So, like, it's there's this kind of bit, there's this kind of almost, like, this bit of sweetness to it. Like this. That's cool. There's the druid, which is herb and berry. The paladin, which is aromatic white tea. <laughs> And can you imagine that if you had a campaign and everyone's there with their own respective brews and just how the kind of sense of that could kind of permeate the air, as it were, really? And yeah, we've been we've been drinking the tea. It's been great. I mean, I've not done any RPGs, but the tea's great. It's really good tea. Like they've put a lot of effort into it. Genuinely, it's not a gimmick. It's really good tea. I think I think that's that's the key thing to all of this stuff, right? Because you see that kind of thing at a convention, you think, yeah, all right, like. I, 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 you've seen an easy mark here and you think you can make a lot of money on it. And then you realise that while board game conventions are popular, and I think Aircon had its biggest year this year, um, yeah. they're not big enough to the point where you can absolutely rinse an audience for, with, for a cheap buck. Like You either have to make a really good product or you're only going to be there once or twice and then you're gone because you, you know, you won't be able to, it won't be worth the... the the outlay right to, to actually go and have a thing there like one of the one of the people that i spoke to meeple design like chris and i met them at tabletop right. gaming live in manchester and that was their first convention yeah and then we saw them again here at aircon and it's just great to see companies like that you know progressing through the chain and and getting better and moving from convention to convention um like i i liked pete the who is it that you spoke to was it fights and fancy um, yeah, talk to fights and fancy. So they are t- uh, uh, two people who are putting together sort of RPG adjacent material. So they they really wanted to do a character sheet where, if you're familiar with Dungeons and Dragons Fifth Edition, the character sheet is it's fine, like it's okay. But there's a lot of people who have made their own different versions of character sheets. And one of the one of the particular challenges is if you're um, if you have some sort of neuro spiciness to yourself right if you've got some sort of uh you know if you've got uh if you're dyslexic or if you are colorblind to some degree those things are not built with accessibility in mind right because they are i mean apart from anything it's a relatively new thing i suppose not new it's not new obviously but like a lot of companies have not really paid much attention to accessibility um in their user interface um, in their books and stuff like that, and so this, um, and so yeah, this company basically wanted to put together a character sheet that meant that if you had something along those lines, it would just be much more readable, right? And that helps everyone, right? It doesn't just help out the people who have got dyslexia or or or, or, or whatever it ends up being. Um, and they also were putting together, and this is this is the thing I love about about the um, about the show is. These small companies taking a punt, they are doing a two-player, so one one and one, not one on one, one and one uh, role-playing game with no GM. So no person running it all, just two players sat together having a role-playing game experience and there is no master of the game. And they're doing this and the way they are delivering it is they have handmade everything. So... I think it's like hand stitched books put together like really nice quality really lovely well put together stuff but very clearly like not you know smash them out at a thousand pages a second amazon printing service right yeah. like, like not like that and they're selling them in a nondescript brown box like like rpgs in the early 70s were doing uh and they come with like 
a pencil and like a dice and it's got all the lovely little bits and pieces in it and you can just you can feel like the love of it of what they're doing and when you actually get to then talk to them about like why on earth are you doing this like you want to find out like why are you putting this stuff together why are you putting your time and effort into making something like this and they'll tell you all about it and 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 you get to hear about it you get to hear about these people who yes it's you know it's a a business for them but it's also like they are in it for the love of games and they're using this business to to basically stay in this thing that this medium that they really really do care about and have a lot of passion for not simply just to make a buck i managed to talk to a designer and and their business partner and they are two people who run a a, a company called yay games and for me Sure, T and Me may have been Chris's product of the show, but for me, the game of the show is Ominos and Holy Cow. Oh my uh, word. Oh my word, Ominos. So so I was busy myself with Oh no, what was I? Yeah, I was playing Star Wars the deck building. Yeah, game, yeah, yeah. Which is Was nice. It's uh possibly a disappointing re implementation of Star Realms. Okay. And I walked over to find you two giggling with a, a strange man <laughs> who you'd only just met. Yep. Playing his his game. Yep. Um, Andrew. That looked like Andrew. That looked like you know he'd hand drawn. And this is not this is not to denigrate it, but actually I think it's probably one of its selling points. Looked like he'd hand drawn every oh. single. Oh, copy. Yeah, absolutely. And and let me let me let me tell you. I did. I, so I actually walked past that stall about three or four different times, right? And I I I did that thing where I, I sort of turned my nose up a little bit at it because when you look at Omino's, the visual design of it is quite straightforward, quite basic. It the travel edition, which is the edition that I purchased, comes in a, a slightly nondescript faux brown leather tube. With a white, white, <laughs> white little stopper on the end. When you shake it all out, uh, the stuff that comes out is a neoprene-looking mat with what looks like hand, you know, self-made visual board. Some dice, which are okay put together, but they're not like the finest quality dice that you've ever seen. Um, and a single uh, piece of paper that has all of the rules on which again the layout of it looks is fine totally serviceable like like but it's not got that same level of like mawa sheen as like a fantasy flight mm-hmm. right at the height of their like let's yeah. just spend loads of money on all this right no and they were just kind of there and he was in and and i walked past it two or three times and i thought oh it, clearly this is just somebody having a bit a bit of a go at it and uh, i don't know and then i noticed that they that they had a game with the Gruffalo license. And then I noticed that they had a game with um, London Underground. And as somebody Thunderbirds. Wo- and Thunderbirds. Yeah, sorry, I forgot Thunderbirds. And as somebody who works a lot with IPs in, in, in their day job, I know how hard it is to get access to certain IPs, and I know how hard it is to work with those companies. And I was like, okay, that's interesting. That, that means that there's a level of professionalism here that is, that is beyond what this this particular bit of the 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 sort of like almost DIY aesthetic kind of belies. So I went over and started talking to them about, you know, about IP based game creation, right? Because I just went to something. play a game. Right. <laughs> right. And like right, here he comes, here he comes. IP guy. IP um, man. And got chatting with them and uh, got chatting with both of them and they were they were really open and honest about how it was all going and and, and it was really interesting to hear like you know they they've had definitely had some really great successes and definitely been working on some really interesting products. The the underground game is not being published by them, it's being published by Gibsons. And Gibsons are a wow. big company. Like that, that, yeah, that, is, that is a big company. I was like, huh. And I said, so what, what should I play then? And um, Andrew basically showed us how to play Omino's. And Omino's, holy, holy cow. Um, it's about seven years old, this game. It's about seven years old. And I have, where, I, how did I not know about this? Right. So, so basically, the, con- the, the core conceit of the game is you have a, a, a whole bunch of different dice, and all the dice are exactly the same, okay? But on each face are, are a bunch of different symbols. Four of them are red, blue, green, and yellow. 
and they are the symbols essentially represent the Egyptian gods. Okay, the theme is, eh, but like it's fine. It's serviceable. It's certainly not the worst use of a theme I've, I've, I've ever seen. And then there's two other symbols, and both of them are black, and one of them is a sort of hieroglyphic ass looking uh, like person one arm raised and one arm lowered as if it's kind of like an s sideways you know what i mean like the if i were to say walk yeah. like an egyptian that it's that um and then the other one is an aroboros is that what it's, is that how it's yeah it's like an aroboros yeah. yeah yeah and all of the dice are the same they all look like that and each player has a color and your job basically is to roll the dice and whatever face comes up uh, let's say, for example, you've got you you roll a yellow sun. You look at the board, and if there's a yellow sun already on the board, you move that three spaces on a grid, right? So the board is a grid, and you of, of squares, and you move it the yellow piece three spaces, and you have to do it three. No doubling back on oneself. No other colours. Nothing. Then once you've done that, you then place your own yellow dice that you've just rolled onto the board any way you like okay now if you've got your own color so you might not be playing yellow but you might have rolled yellow you might be playing red you can only score red colored dice and to score the dice you have to have four or more dice that are adjacent to one another so no diagonals but other than that as long as you have four that touch one another on the sides that's all good that's all good and you can score those those four the black symbols change things ever so slightly. So the Ouroboros uh, is, uh, if that face comes up once you've rolled it, you are then able to re-roll any one dice on the board and then put it back exactly where it was. So you can help yourself out or more likely screw over somebody else. And if you get the walk like an Egyptian character, um, you can move any dice of any color uh, up uh, three spaces and then place that uh, walk like Egyptian character down on the board any way you like and those black dice are wild so they're worth any color so uh, they are where the game gets really interesting because a simple sort of simple idea match four of the same color easy once you start adding in these wild dice suddenly which are totally usable by anybody who's playing suddenly then it starts to get very strategic where you're starting to think Okay, if I play, place that here, then that will help me out, but it will also help this other person out if they, if they see that I'm doing this here. So what I'll do is I'll place it over here and then hope that I get... And you're thinking like multiple steps ahead. The way I, saw, the way I kind of started to think about it was it's basically a perfect distillation of the thinking ahead of chess, but in a far more graspable manner, right? In a way that yes, you have to think ahead and you have to you have to plan. You can't quite plan everything ahead because you're sort of thinking to yourself, well, there's some randomness in there, but I don't know how my the my opponents are going to work. But as soon as you know what color they've got, you sort of think, okay, I think they're going to go here. So if they do that and then they do that, I I can do this. And you're building out these little strategies. It's two to four player, so it's really flexible, really flexible. Um, and the two-player mode introduces some smart little new rules that make it keep it really, really competitive, which I think is really, really good, which we won't go into, but they're very, very, very clever. And here's the thing. I have played this game four times in the last week. That is oh my God. unbelievable for me, right? Yeah, for you. And it's yeah. partly because it's brilliant, but partly because it takes 10 minutes. Yeah. Like, you start a game... And people who have never played it before, you have finished that game in 10 to 15 minutes. And everyone goes, that was really good. <laughs> everyone. Everyone. You realize pretty quickly, like, I, played, I introduced it to my parents the other day. And it's, it, my mum immediately loved it because yeah. she could immediately score something off my dad. And, and that kind of, yeah. that expansion and contraction. Because once you score, your dice are taken off the board. So in instances, the board will be full of these dice that are kind of roughly equidistant between each other. And it's just waiting for them to kind of slowly kind of move to score big. And in other instances, there's no dice really on the board. And I asked Andrew, so this is Andrew Harmon who designed, I asked him, I said, like, You've designed like a lot of games, as you say, Pete, responding to different IP. What's the kind of like, what's your design style? What, 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 what do you look for when you're designing a game? And he said, simple and sneaky. 
brilliant that under and underpins yeah. everything he designs and he, and that is it in a nutshell Ominous. oh ominous is exactly that like and it takes it takes one or two turns around the board for every single person at the table to go oh okay i get it i get it okay and then it, it just it flies like every single person i've put it in front of and i've put it now in front of i think 10 different people every single person that i've put it in front of loved it um, every single person got it. Even people who really, you know, struggle with mm-hmm. understanding rules and, and 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 aren't necessarily people who play board games that much, immediately got it. And immediately, and this is why I think it's a really good distillation of of thinking ahead. Immediately started doing that really sneaky stuff of like figuring out how they're going to outmaneuver other people. Right? You get to the heart of what the game actually is very quickly. You get to where the strategy is super fast because the actions are so, so quick. The way you two talk about this game and the fact that you both bought a copy, yeah. and even though uh, I know that Chris always says that our collections are... Yeah, what's mine is yours, It's a shared collection. Absolutely. I still feel... I still am slightly jealous that I didn't pick up a copy. Well, you, you, you and Pete like, help yourself to something pretty sizable before I even arrive. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yes, we did. Um, Pete, Pete, j- just to preface this, is, is Pete is a very bad slash good influence yeah. in terms of having someone over your shoulder. Yeah. The word is enabler. Enabler. <laughs> He's both the white angel and the red devil of one's conscience. Um, and entering into the, um, the Aladdin's palace that is the bring and buy sale was dangerous with Pete because, well... I'd I'd gone in that in there on my own and like saw some stuff that um, oh yeah I'd quite like to I've always wanted to play that oh yeah it's a good price I I know what I'll do I'll I'll, I'll I'll just go and get myself some lunch and I'll come back and if it, and if it's still there I'll buy all gone all gone it happened to me the whole weekend yeah. that stuff I dithered about and didn't and sort of I'll think about it all went all lost I lost some possibly some great games um, because of that but. One game that Pete made sure that I did not leave without was a copy of Twilight Imperium <laughs> Third Edition. I I'm so excited. I'm so excited. I think why I've always wanted to play it is the sheer audacity of of knowing that at some point in the coming year and we've already put a date in our diary. <laughs> I mean that that was the tell, wasn't it? Yeah. At some point in the coming year, I'm going to have to get some of my best friends together in a room and we're going to be sitting there the whole weekend just to play one game. And that kind of fills me with, A, a little bit of trepidation, but but mountains of joy just feeling like each of you plays one of these, um, one of ten <clears throat> distinct alien races and they all have, you know, depth and personality and... You know, if you think about the the couple of paragraphs of blurb you get when you pick an alien race in Cosmic Encounter, that's a whole that's a whole sheet of A4 in Twilight Imperium. Like, there's as much diplomacy in this game as there is mechanics, which is the other thing that has always attracted me to it. Is quite a lot of the game happens off table, and it's 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 you know, Twilight Imperium Fourth Edition has been in my wish list for Amazon for ages. And, you know, 130 quid, it's kind of felt a bit like um, an extravagant expense for A, a game I've never played, B, a game, even if I did buy, when am I, when on earth am I going to play it? And C, a game that takes, is going to take a lot of commitment, not just from me, but every single person playing oh, yeah. it. Because I tell you what, when we meet up for this thing, I am not teaching it to any of you. <laughs> like, I expect people playing this game to sit down and know immediately what they're doing. Because if I'm That's like, got, you've got to be pretty ballsy to rock up, not having <laughs> yeah. read a single bit of the book. Like page one, like like it's a game that it's a game that feels to me like the shorthand for um, extreme, like a, an extreme board game experience. And obviously, there's only so extreme yes. board games can go, right? But but you know, we walked past tables in the in in aircon of people playing Twilight Imperium, and it feels like one of those games that is such an event game whatever happens with it right if it's brilliant if it's awful we will walk out of that weekend with a story right like yeah it will be like 
Yes, we played Twilight Imperium. We played the third edition, and it took us forever. But you know what? It was <laughs> Or it wasn't. We'll either be closer than friends as friends, or yeah. irreparably damaged. Well, that will be the end of the podcast. <laughs> like, yeah. And the, but the brilliant thing about the being a buy is yeah. it was 30 quid. Yeah. And I was so impressed with when I got them all home... Yeah, they were all complete. They they were exactly what they said they were. <laughs> oh, I guess which brings us to the miracle of Aircon 2023. The miracle. The miracle, yes. The miracle. So, um, when Pete and I opened up this copy of Twilight Imperium, it was an absolute mess. It was a state. The cards were everywhere. Um, everything else was in plastic baggies, but the cards were absolutely everywhere. And Twilight Imperium has over, well, I know this for a fact now, <laughs> has over 400 cards in it. So um, even though I was chuffed that I was finally bought a copy, I was really eager to get it back to my hotel room and um, basically get it all out and make sure <laughs> every single thing was in there that was in there. Like, like, that, like the American Beauty poster. <laughs> Yes, yes. So um, I stayed up till two in the morning oh, that night. <laughs> and I counted every single chit, every single token, every single plastic spaceship, every single hexagon, mm-hmm. and every single card. Yeah. A Twilight Imperium third edition. Yeah. And it was missing one single card. Chris, can you imagine that? Oh, my word. 396, I mean... 397, 398, 399. It's a cautionary tale. And and the reason why one card is brought me so much pain is that that's a miscount somewhere. So that's you know surely I've surely I've miscounted. Yeah. Surely surely yeah. that you know I've I've just gone right. Oh, right I'll count I'll them count all again. again. One, two. <laughs> and the next day you're, we're no. walking out of the accommodation. You're like, yeah, I, I'm sure it can be fine because all I need to do is this, this, and this. If I play it with um, this many people, yeah, it'll, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. You were talking yourself around like it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal when clearly it was a big deal. <laughs> anyway, lad, yeah. lad, lads, I was up until two o'clock in the morning, but it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It'll be fine. Yeah. So that was on the Friday. Then on the Sunday, we bearing in mind that the um, bring and buy closed at four p.m. on the Sunday. I think we probably got to about two o'clock and um, we were in the middle of playing a game of wormholes, which we'll come back to. And I was, I'd had my eye on a game, someone was selling a game of Stone Age for quite a reasonable cost. It, it's, it's quite a difficult game to get hold of um, at the moment, if at all. And um, considering I'd sort of lost out on everything else, I thought, you know what? I'm going to go and get this edition of Stone Age. I'm not going to sit here playing wormholes and wait for someone else to grab a bargain and and play this um, sort of legendary worker placement game. I'm just going to go and get it. Now, you toddled off to... Yeah, I literally left the game mid... Mid Mid-game. Mid-turn. Mid-wormhole. Now, something... There are two parallels that happened at this same point. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So... Let's let's keep the focus on you, Sam. Let's keep the camera tracking on you for a little bit, then throw it over to me. Yeah. So the parallel side of things is I'd bought something previously in the bring and buy earlier on in the weekend, so therefore didn't feel the need to go and buy a um a game at that point. But what was critical about this moment is the exact moment that I decided to get up out of my chair. Mm. Because as I was walking around to go and get Stone Age, at that exact moment, a guy from the convention picked up a token off the floor, took it into the little back room, and popped it in a box. And I thought, huh, that's a little bit. Mm. So, so, obviously tokens fall out, and they're picking them up, and they're putting them... So, okay. <laughs> so then, I was standing in the queue, just thinking about this, with my copy of Stone Age under my arm, and I walked past the booth, and I noticed this small cardboard box hidden behind everything. So hidden behind one of the sort of archways that they use to, <coughs> to sell the games. Yeah. And it's a small, nondescript cardboard box. And it had written on it, missing tokens. And so I, I asked the guy, and everyone's all super friendly at Aircon. Can I just have a look inside that box? And he was like, yeah, yeah, of course you can. And it shouldn't even be behind here. I don't know why it's been hidden around. It should be out front so people can have a look in. It's like, okay, brilliant, fantastic. So I started looking in this little box and got to the bottom. 
and suddenly, right at the bottom of this box was the single card mm. that I was missing oh from Twilight Imperium. A beam of light Third shone in. Yep. Angels began to sing. Cut to Pete. <laughs> <laughs> now, cut to me. Camera pans away from the, the bring and buy. Okay. Uh, Chris and me, uh, and I want to say Becca was there yep. at, uh, at the time as well, grousing about <laughs> Sam's gone off and gone off to the thing we were playing in the middle of this game. Um, anyway, Chris says, oh, look, Peter, over there. They've got a copy of the game that you made. And, and I was like, oh, that's really cool. And me, being an idiot, decided to turn round and spark up a conversation with them, quite literally, genuinely. Now, we'll, we'll get to the end of this and you'll be like, no, it wasn't because of that. I genuinely wanted to thank them, right? Because, like, I, it's bonkers that people... I, I always find it bonkers whenever I see that game in public, right? It's, it's done quite well, um, uh, mostly because it's been in Waterstones. Um, and, but I just wanted to turn around to these two lads, big, quite big lads, and, and thank them for buying a copy of Agatha Christie Death on the Cards. And I turn around and I say, is, is that your copy of the, the game? And one of them goes, no, it's my mum's. And his mum was, because it's Aircon, it's a family show, his mum was sat next to them. And they, they don't, I don't, I think, don't necessarily think they were huge like board gamers or anything like that. And I turned around to them and she was like, oh yeah, are you a fan as well? And I said, oh no, actually I helped make that game. I helped produce, produce that game. And she immediately started talking to me about how she said, you're joking. And she came over and started talking to me. She was like, this is the game where, where I work, we had to extend our lunch breaks out because somebody bought this game in as a bit of an icebreaker for people and we couldn't stop playing it, right? And I was like, you're joking. <laughs> and they were like, no, we absolutely love this. In fact... And then she goes over to the box, pulls out the, the manual, uh, the rule book in it, and she says, can you sign it for me? Because all the girls in the office will be jealous. To which I was like, I was like... Now, now Sam, you, you know what Pete's handwriting's like. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it looks like a... Seismograph uh, reading. <laughs> yeah. And, and so I was like, this has gone in a very different... I, this has gone in a very different direction to the way that I thought it w that it would go. And we just started talking about it. And it was genuinely like, that's the first time I've ever had to sign something. And it was like weird, real weird, but also like amazing. It was like an aircon miracle of like, they really like this thing. It was right there. We'd paused in the middle of the game to, for you to go off. Now, the camera pans away from my face in absolute shock and astonishment. <laughs> yeah. To me. To you. Waltzing back over with my copy of Stone yeah. Age. Do, do, Cock do, of the do, walk. Do, 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 do. Yeah. Yeah. Plop it down. Pop it down. Guess what happened, guys? <laughs> and then, yeah, just revealed. Revealed. That I'd got the this card. This massive, massive miracle. It was an aircon miracle. Two aircon Two air miracles. miracles. So let's let's talk about let's talk about some games, um, some other games, some board games. Um, let's do wormholes because it was the scene of the two miracles <laughs> of Aircon. Um, it was the yep <laughs> the conduit. There'll be a blue plaque there next year. Yeah, <laughs> this was the site and this was the game um, that converged worlds together, literally and figuratively. Um, so wormholes is a game by the guy who made Tiny Towns, Peter McPherson. And Tiny Towns is becoming one of my most regular um, sort of games to make appearances at the table, mostly because it's got quite a large player count, plays up to six out of the box, which is, which is great. But secondly, because it is so adaptable and flexible and it's a super, it's a really a sort of town planning strategy game. So when um, we initially got sent wormholes, I was a little bit... Um, I, I didn't really know what to expect because Tiny Towns is a game about building a tiny town for mice and hedgehogs. And this is Wormholes, which is a game about essentially being running a bus company in space. Um, so Wormholes is 
you have lots of these sort of map pieces, these hex based map pieces that you lay out on the table. Every player gets um, a bunch of little tokens to help track things like energy and when they're picking up um, when they're picking up passengers and when they're dropping off passengers, and then they get a bunch of these nice round little tokens that indicate their wormholes. And essentially, the game is about picking up passengers and dropping them off. But space is huge, so you can only ever move three hexes on a go, which is super inefficient. You're never going to get to where you need to be in time. However, if you start plopping your little wormholes around this board, suddenly you can zoom from one wormhole to another in an instant, zipping you across the galaxy, visiting planets. The more planets you can go to visit and the more um, passengers you can drop off at each planet, the more points you're going to get. Points mean prizes. Points means you're going to win. And there's a bare simplicity to wormholes where um, the manual actually opens up with, you know, this is how you're going to win. This is, this, is, this is how you get points and this is how you're going to win. And I quite enjoy that because in terms of like teaching it, it makes the whole teach super simple because I was able to tell you and, you and Peter, Chris, how, you know, you get points by dropping off passengers at planets if someone uses one of your wormholes, you get points. If you visit more planets, um, if you visit more than five planets, you also get points. That's pretty much it. And then you're just left to go and zip around, zip around the universe. And I think, like for me, what what is irresistible about this game is in part is the player interaction is quite minimal. And I've realised I quite my sweet spot mm-hmm. is this really, um, where okay. you, you're kind of doing it you're, you're you're providing a service for other people around the table as well and there's always something quite nice when somebody <laughs> yeah. when somebody chucks you know a victory point marker your way and says oh thanks very much it's almost like you're like it's a toll road and it kind of is really <laughs> yeah. one thing that i my brain was not adaptable enough to kind of fully comprehend which is the beauty of this game is when you look at the board it is a, you know it's it's a it's a game that's full of hex spaces and you think oh my word i've got to get from here to here to deliver this but actually no you haven't because towards the end of the game when people put wormholes down in strategic places and again when you put the wormhole down and you find its pair you flip them both open it's like you've opened the stargate it's a lovely little thing there yes suddenly um that board game space shrinks massively one space yes and there are so many little nice touches in this game that make your life so much easier so there's a space station in one corner which you can zip around and it's very very useful to get like from the discard pile kind of like i suppose thematically it's like stray errands or stray passengers or lost luggage say for example but that is one you move you you take one move and you can zip around the entire space station so there's lots of little things this game does which um, means that you can be as efficient as you can and it's a really satisfying thing to watch other people just zipping back and forth using your various different wormholes, maybe doubling back and reusing them on the same leg to maximise as much as they can out of the you know, their quota of action points, essentially. And then it becomes this lovely, almost Euro-style game where I've just got my own company. I'm not going to get in the way of yours, Sam. Um, obviously, you and I can't no. share a space, but you know, you, you, you're you using my road. I'll scratch your back, you'll scratch mine. And then at the end, we just kind of reveal what we've got. Uh, essentially and there's no hard feelings there's no like oh area control this is your section of space now oh you've done really well to carve that up i can't go there anymore no it's actually oh great i'm really glad you've done that because it's going to make my life so much easier now getting from this side of the board Mm -hmm. to this side so i can get my my sixth planet and start scoring some additional points here now for the end of the game yeah that that expansion and contraction is is the most is is the most delightful is the most delightful thing about it there's there's a lovely sort of when you get to the end of the game watching people trying to puzzle out how they're going to maximize that turn because you get three you know three moves in a turn and that's it but traveling through wormholes is free or using one of the you know the special symbols or you know, that you find around the universe can can extend your travel and extend your reach 
So looking at this space and looking at these delightful little wormholes that pop up all over it and seeing how you can write, I've got three passengers for this planet, but I'm all the way over here. How am I going to get there in three turns and maybe try and get somewhere else so I can set up my next turn? And a game that starts off quite slow and plodding, as you said, but at the end, everyone's just like zipping around from one piece to the other. And it's not really about who wins at the end when the times that i've played it the joy comes from seeing another player really eke out and maximize everything that's going on on around the board like the best and you can't help but applaud players that that do that so yeah i really enjoyed wormholes i think it's it's a another great design from um uh, a, a great designer who Apparently, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a massive fan of. Um, I was thinking, um, as just before we talk about a slightly bigger game, there was one that you played, mm. Sam, that I got a little bit of jealousy that you bought, and I didn't. Because uh-huh. what was quite cool about Aircon was you actually had some stools there yeah. that were, um, were, were kind of manned by... You had stools there that were kind of from like local games companies, so from Harrogate and Games Crusade were there, and they had like demos of games on the table. Sam, you and I played Kites, which was that real time sand timer kind of game where we had to play cards to get all our kites in the air. But we also played yeah. Cluster, which uh, is am- <laughs> like Omino's, is immediately. You play yes. it for a few seconds. You go, yep, yeah, cool, 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 cool. I get it now. I get it now. Just leave me alone. I just want to play yeah, this cool. game. Yeah. I, I, the only game I've ever opened up and comes with a warning, <laughs> like a literal health warning to say, like, if, if, you, if you wear a pacemaker, yeah. <laughs> just, just be careful about this game because yeah. there's really strong magnets. In Hang this. back because <laughs> this may not be great for you. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Cluster, Cluster was great and it was... Um, yeah, and Games Crusade were great as well because I think it was their first time at Aircon as well, and um, it was it was just great speaking to the, the the people who run it, and they just showed us Cluster, and I bought it there on the spot because it's 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 just one of it's those instantly understandable games where each player has a set of magnets, and they just got to put them down in a um, in a in a inside a rope that you also lay down and basically if any of the magnets get attracted to each other i.e cluster Mm. um, then you have to pick up all those magnets and add them essentially to your hand meaning that you're less likely to win the game there are ways that you can manipulate the space so you can pull parts of the rope towards you or maybe you know away from you in, in order to create a bit more space or you can use the magnets in your hand to attract or repel magnets in the space. No. Yeah. In order to make that space for you to for you to put down mag and it's just yeah. I played this before. So I played this actually down a pub, uh, down left handed giant in Bristol, um ahead of uh a couple of months ago actually now. And somebody just brought it along and I was like what it, this seems like it maybe it must be an old game. Like I was like, I d I don't know why you know where this has come from. What a pub game. Like, what a game to play down the pub. Like, perfect little thing. Like, um, competitive. You, It's one of those games. It's like, it's like the genius of, like the, of the Wii Sports series. You know that moment where you handed the Wii Sports <laughs> controller to your grandmother? And when she said, how do I swing the racket? You said, you swing the racket. You just swing the racket. Yeah. Cluster is one of those games whereby... You immediately, because it's a dexterity game to a, yeah. lot, uh, 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 you know, to to a big degree. You immediately don't have to. Ex- you, you, there's what ten seconds of explaining what the rules are, and you just got to go. Like it's so obvious. And those it's, it's, and those magnets are really powerful. They are. Really I love strong. those moments where you're you're kind of hovering the magnet above the space you think is going to be perfect, and you can just see the other ones around start to twitch a little. And like, mm. Yeah. Yeah, and then that, that that sound of all the magnets clacking together and clustering—it's like a transformer. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> like it is. It they they've put 
whether by accident or by design, like the the look and the feel and the sound of those magnets coming together yeah. is, you know, that you can just immediately tell. It's it's. I think one of the things that I that I do love about it is that you know that sound when the Jenga tower falls and you immediately know, well, you know, something big has happened. But then you have got to pick up all the Jenga pieces. Like, well, you know, that was fun for a second. In cluster, you get that moment again and yeah. again and again and again as you hear that clack of the of the things of the things coming together. There was, um, I mean, we played a ton of stuff, but there was one game which all of us played for the first time um, and was probably one of the most interesting and different games that we played all weekend. It's called Tragedy Looper, New Tragedies. Now, Um, when you got this box out, I will level with you. I was like, where is Sam? (laughs) And why is this weird <laughs> doppelganger of Sam getting out some weird anime, anime smut game? Like, immediately looked at the box art and was like, this is not a Sam game. There is a lot of anime on here. And yeah. I, I, am, I, I was like, I've, I've agreed to play this. And I may, am I going to now <laughs> regret my decision? Um, yeah. I, I mean, yeah, I don't know if I'm completely sold on the artwork yet but this this is this is a game that has a fair bit of lineage around mm-hmm. it um i think the first one came out in 2011 yeah, okay. and there's been about 10 or 11 expansions for it since then um and i think they were all released with z-man which is a publishing company and now WizKids look like they've acquired the license and this is a brand new sort of um uh, a box which isn't an expansion so it's you know a new standalone edition of of tragedy looper and they're, and they're all designed by backer fire um which is the pseudonym of a, a japanese a game designer um ito yoshin ito and the concept of tragedy looper is that you have one person around the table who plays what is called the mastermind and then everyone else around the table plays the protagonists in the mastermind story. And what they've got to do is they've got to try and work out what the mastermind's plan is and stop it. And how they do that is essentially by witnessing the tragedies happening going back in time, witnessing them again, going back in time, witnessing again, going back in time and witnessing again, essentially Groundhog, you know, a board game equivalent of Groundhog Day, witnessing the same events happening over and over and over again. And within those loops, trying to make adjustments, change where characters go, trying to get characters on on the side of the protagonist by giving them goodwill and trying to deduce what the mastermind is doing, who they're trying to put together, who they're trying to make uneasy, who they are moving into certain locations to work out what's the plot, who the characters are, and what is actually happening in this to try and stop the tragedies happening before time runs out. Is that a fair sort of yeah. elevator pitch? Yeah, it's a bit like Sexy Brutal. Yes, like Sexy Brutal. Yeah. yeah. played that video game. So the, the compelling thing about this game is that, and you'll be able to tell me as, as, as the protagonist, but it strikes me of a game of pure deduction. Like, you as the protagonists have absolutely no idea going in what on earth is going on? All you have is a cheat sheet which has these are the three plots, these are the three subplots, and these are the characters who are involved in this scenario. That's it. You've got and and that's all the information that you that you kind of have. You know how certain characters might might behave and have effects on other people in the scenario. You know um uh, you, you kind of know the outcomes of certain plots and things like that, but but really you have just a board in front of you with four locations, characters on top, and then suddenly 
because I was the mastermind, I just start putting down cards and then people start dying <laughs> or moving around yeah. and making people feel uneasy and you guys have no idea what's going yeah, on. Yeah, it, 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 it made me think of like a game, something like Love Letter Cross with something like Mysterium where you're this strange mastermind who are, is kind of moving the pieces and we have to kind of join the dots. And as you say, there is a crib sheet. We are given a player aid and that player aid is a, quite an intimidating table quite a dry looking table of basically different permutations akin to some kind of social deduction games. You know, if these two character types are together, this will be the outcome. So you can kind of almost start to kind of deduce certain things. But as you say, Sam, we've only got three loops. And like, I really love those kinds of straight deduction games. I almost wanted all of us to be playing together against the game because like, this strange figure of the mastermind, you know, it, it, it's like what well, it became a difficult thing for me to kind of try and grapple with, really, because obviously you're you're adhering to it. I, I don't know how you see it, because obviously we never saw it from your perspective, but some kind of framework or script, say, for example. And and it felt like that we you were kind of like out of the loop with what we were talking about. Whereas having, you know, say the the four of us or working against the game. I think that'd be a, I think that would be a much more enjoyable experience for me or at least one versus one where it feels like almost like that kind of game of chess, that kind of tug of war between the two of us in terms of trying to outdo each other. I'm thinking almost Sam you and I recently played again Watergate and that tug of war yes. every time, you know, oh. you you are starting to establish a connection. I'm putting a roadblock in front of you as Nixon. But I think I think the the thing I really liked about it is it thematically it actually did work really well um you know the it really felt like sam was a mastermind right it really felt like we were sat there like what is he doing like how do we figure this out and then once we got i, th I think maybe halfway through the game session that we had we started to notice little patterns and from there it must have been, you know, I'm sure the pressure was starting to mount on you, Sam, of like, oh, hold on a second. They they might have started to understand why where I'm going with some of this stuff. Because I know one of the rules that you mentioned that's optional is you can have everybody be completely silent except for in the breaks between. And we decided not to do that. We decided to actually converse with one another. And so I'm sure that if you heard us saying things like, I think this person is this role. That must be quite difficult as the, um, you know, the mischief maker to basically be the person who goes <laughs> to, to, you know, the person who, you know, oh, all my best laid plans are starting to unravel. I need to put them off the scent now. Like, how do I, you know, do that? I think it was really thematic. It was a game that I think I came away from it with uh, the same level of hot brain that I sometimes come away from Sherlock Holmes with, a uh, consulting detective, yep. where I was like, oh God, like I've really had to think about this. This is not a, what's that, beer and pretzel? This is not a beer and pretzels game, right? This is a game where like, now nah, you are going to sit down and think about this. <laughs> like, um, I really, I thought it was great. I just, I, I think the, I think that is a game that, if you have like a regular set of board game fans, right, that, that are with you all the time, right, you get like a regular board game evening. I will bet you that if you were like, if one was to say, right, we're going to play this game and we're going to play it every Wednesday together, every single week, we're going to play it together. And we're going to go through every single one of these together. I'll bet you that game, I'll bet you that could very easily become somebody, some gaming group's favorite game. Very easily. Like, mm-hmm. As yep. a one-off, I think it's really, it's really tricky. It's really like, it's not an easy game to explain to people. It's not an easy sell for like, new. I, I, how, Chris, how would you get your mum to play this game? No, because my dad would be the mastermind <laughs> and she'd bloody hate it. Right, 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 sure. <laughs> I, I think, I think like, because like there are games out there that we played that are pure deduction, like something like Cryptid, which you've mentioned previously on the podcast before, where like, it is pure deduction because the thing you're looking for can only exist in this one location and you have sure. to try and puzzle it out 
based on the, the, the almost like the mastermind really what other people do on the board really I think the challenge for me was that each person has a particular ability that is not necessarily tied to the role they have in this particular scenario but to access that role we have to gamble on loading them with certain qualities to unlock that ability and we could be putting a lot of effort given we've only got three goes at this into trying to deduce or unmask a particular character to find out they're completely redundant they're a red herring so that was the thing that i found a challenge and given the fact you have no you can't really puzzle out what is relevant and who you know who's a key player in this until the mastermind has got some way through their kind of like their planning um that becomes a, a little bit of a challenge i think but from my point as a mastermind I could, because I knew everything, I knew who the characters were, I could see the danger in you just unmasking one person could mean all the dominoes then fit into place for every yeah. every single yeah. single piece. Like, at the moment I'm playing Curse of the Golden Idol and it is one of the, the best games I've ever played. Um, it, it will possibly surpass Oprah Din for me in terms of detective and deduction games. Wow. And it has that same feeling of a little information clicking at just the right time and all the dominoes falling into place and connecting everything together and making you feel incredibly, incredibly smart and intelligent is is staggering. And I think when it comes to tragedy looper, it's a thing that I'm most upset about because if you if you pick up this game, be careful because one one of you is going to have to be the mastermind, and it's a lot of work. I read though that it comes with two rule books, which is which is really good. It's really well explained, and I think the onboarding for new players is done in a really nice way. But it's such a huge task, I think, that convincing another person around the table to then be the mastermind is probably not going to be not going to happen. So I know I'm probably never going to be able to interact with this game from a deductive point of view. Like I'll always be the mastermind and always be the person trying to get in everyone's get in everyone's way because it is a it is a big um, sort of undertaking. I mean, I I loved it and I loved seeing you guys picking the holes in it and I kind of enjoyed the deduction for you in the same way that you know it's fun to see Poirot yeah. or Sherlock Holmes deduce a mystery and, and, and pick things apart even if it's a mystery that I'm putting together but yeah it's the the mastermind role is is probably the, the biggest sticking point for me but but some people will love that some people will 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 adore being the Moriarty of it all rather than the Sherlock Holmes Um, right, let's 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 close this thing because I feel like um, well done you if you've made it to the end of us three of us talking about air. What a nice weekend we house. had. Sam, <laughs> can I ask if, if Pete was a tea, what would he be? How would you yeah, describe careful. the flavour profile careful. of Peter Willington as a tea? I think um, there was there was a point in time where Tetley's or PG tips thought it was a good idea to bring out a tea that was flavoured like digestive biscuits. And I think that that sums up. <laughs> well, really I, I know for a fact that that is one of your partner's favourite teas. That is one of my partner's favourite teas, and I hate it. <laughs> You are very dunkable, Pete. <laughs> but, uh, if you were a tea, Chris, you would be silver tip. Nice, lovely. I love Sam, that. Sam, what would you? What What do you think you would be? I don't know. Can you get fizzy tea? Oh. I don't. I I think I'd be matcha because um, annoying to make. Uh, not many people. Uh, like me but get along with me because I think it may benefit me at some point in the future and <laughs> a bit pretentious uh, difficult to get uh, hold of I don't know a unique taste but a delicious one <laughs> yeah there you go great in a laugh you stir him a bit just so you can does he, you know <laughs> he mixes well he mixes well otherwise I'm quite yeah. gritty 
<laughs> Great in a cupcake. Anyway, yeah. Um, if you think you'd have, if you have an idea for a range of teas based around <laughs> um, uh, the four of us, then do <laughs> send us an email, stayinginpod at gmail.com. Yeah. Uh, staying in pod, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. You can see some pictures um, on Instagram from Aircon if you would like to get a bit more of it down your neck. Mm-hmm. Um, thanks very much for, for, to AEG for WizKids for sending us Wormholes and Tragedy Looper. Also, thanks um, to the um, plethora of people who we met on the convention floor. I mean, we didn't even mention that we spoke to um, Rebellion Unplugged. They've got a new game coming out on Kickstarter later this year called Joyride, which looks great. Um, Cosmos, Hachette, who were lovely as always. Um, 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 Rainy Day Games as well. Absolutely enjoyable and lovely weekend. And thank you to everyone at Aircon as well. You did it. You did it. That'll do.